Welcome to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors. Dr. Allen chats with successful investors exploring their journey from setback to triumph. Through this window, we glimpse the truths that inspire our guests to invest abundantly and flourish in all areas of life. And now your host, Dr. Allen. Hello, viewers and listeners. Thank you for tuning in to Creekside Chats. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. Today, we chat with an energetic entrepreneur who has grown his multifamily holdings to over 8,000 units. While doing so, he developed an exceptional reputation in the industry. To open investment opportunities to others in partnership with his wife, Tamil, he founded Think Multifamily. As a distinguished teacher and coach, he joyfully leads others on their journey to personal and financial success. Please join me in welcoming Mark Kenny. No, thanks for having me, Alan. I really appreciate it. Well, great. Um, well, Mark has a whole lot more to share with us than what I just shared in his brief uh, bio here. So, um, Mark, what I'd like to start with is, I, I think a lot of people are, are interested in how did people become entrepreneurs and how did you take that entrepreneurial spirit into real estate? Um, you know, some people just seem to have a knack for entrepreneurialism and then there's others like myself that we've had to learn that skill. And so tell us, where did you, where did you start out and where did you get this bug to actually be an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I'm one of seven kids. I actually have an identical twin brother as well. Oh, wow. Grew up in Michigan. We're in Dallas now and nobody in our family or even extended family, aunts, uncles, or anything like that were entrepreneurs really at all. Really? Wow. So for me, it, it, it really became more of a, initially a money thing. Uh -huh. did. Uh, <laughs> we grew up with very, very little. Uh -huh. You know, we were you know, buying our own bikes when we we're 10 years old and buying clothes our, our, ourselves. Not because my parents were mean, they just didn't have the money. We had seven well, kids. Yeah, seven kids that you got to have a lot of money. <laughs> and seven kids and not much money coming in. So True, yeah. my dad would be working weekends and nights and things oh, like wow. that. And he'd be gone sometimes, you know, a uh, hundred hours a week because he was a firefighter too. So in some cases oh, wow. he was gone three days there and then he'd be gone at a lumber yard for another 40 hours sometimes in a week. So work ethic wise, both my parents did a lot that way. So I got the work ethic from my parents without, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But my brother and I were probably were the only ones really growing up. They always kind of had this mindset since we were little. I mean, we were probably seven, eight years old where we said we're going to start our own business. At that time, mm -hmm. it was going to be more of a sporting goods because we liked uh, basketball a lot and things like that. And um, we just always thought of different ideas here and there without really any mentor or direction or, or any uh, guidance per se. I remember we were probably 10, 11 years old. We met with a manufacturing company about manufacturing plastic bikes. To At make 10 years old? We were probably, we were 10 or 11. Wow. Um, and uh, nothing really happened out of it. Our whole idea was making lighter bikes and how would you do that and, and but still strong and uh, so we, that's we amazing kind of had for a 10 year old, whether when and where we had different ideas, we had different <laughs> ideas, they no money. And, um, but we both, uh, went to school and went to Michigan state, went for accounting and kind of got caught in the corporate world. But even that, when we were in school, when we were seniors, we both, my brother and I said, well, you know, real estate makes a lot of sense to us for very analytical mindset and I can touch it. I can feel it. People need mm -hmm. a place to live. So when we were seniors in college, we started looking at properties, mostly like duplexes, two units, three units, things like that. We bought a property. Uh, when we actually bought a property, got our, we had a property under contract and my, my dad. So you did this while you were, so you were seniors, both we of you were seniors. Yeah. So we this lived is at home our senior, yeah, we lived at home our senior year, which was, which was nice. We went, uh, just two days a week, but it was, you know, from like eight in the morning till nine at night, mm -hmm. one of those type deals. So we had time, we bought, we were buying our hometown and we would, we would take our dad with us and things like that. And uh, we had a deal, we got under contract. And I remember driving back after class one day and my dad, I met with my dad, this was, you know, whatever, 20, uh, you know, over 25 years ago. I remember exactly where I was sitting, time of day, all that stuff. And he yeah. talked me out of the deal. He scared oh, me out of it. Oh no. So, um, but shortly after that, we got another deal 
on, under contract. We closed the deal before we told my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so it was done and idea, uh big yeah. rehab we rehabbed the property and rented it out and it didn't go great because we we started buying more properties but both my brother and i were doing consulting at the time we had graduated we were doing it consulting i was traveling in some cases you know five days a week and mm -hmm. coming home and working on the properties and shoveling snow in michigan and, and things like that but i always knew that you know you're going to be for most jobs you're only going to go so far and they have certain limits what you can make and they have certain thresholds and that bothered me frankly i always mm -hmm. thought if someone could perform sales is the exception in mm -hmm. a lot of companies but i really wasn't a sales guy but that's the exception so i always thought people that perform better and were better should be making my mind considerably more because they're doing more and that wasn't always the case so you know i worked corporate world for a while continued to buy small properties on our own and then in uh 2013 I had an IT business I started so I'm an entrepreneur there 2008 I started it with people like 2008 but it did well I had a number of fortune 100 companies that were clients and things like that but my biggest issue was I just couldn't shut it off I mean any project that came along I would take it didn't matter whether the mm -hmm. you know timelines were unrealistic I used to tell people I was working 80 85 hours probably were actually working 90 to 100 hours a week consistently you know, every it's week. easy to do, yeah. But with yeah, success, you know, and uh, sleep three hours a night. Yeah, and it became 2008, and then 13, 14, somewhere around there. Then um, kind of a rude awakening. You know, I had a walk with my wife, and she's like, you know, hey, this is not working. You're you're never here. You're working all the time, and I'm thinking about you know leaving, which was pretty, you know. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I was like, uh, their first thoughts were like, really? Come on, you know, I'm to myself. You know, I do, I still do a lot with the kids. I would usually pick them up from school, you know, things like that. I would, mm -hmm. I would do a lot with them, but basically, you know, um, ignore my wife's meal. So I said, well, I'll look at other things, but I don't really have the bandwidth. You have to help me. We went to an event and it was more about syndication. Before we actually went there, I, a friend of mine was syndicating, just a fancy word for bringing other investors alongside him to buy typically larger properties. Mm -hmm. And my friend was doing this. It was like 116 unit property and I invested money through my uh, retirement funds and uh, and looked at it and go, went, you know, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Buying larger properties. I was pretty analytical so I could analyze the numbers pretty quickly. Could kind of get an idea what he was going to potentially make off the deal, which was, which was pretty good. And um, went to an event, met some other people, things like that. And then my wife went to the, the next event after that, which was a few months later. And we ended up um, deciding that, hey, we're really going to make a run at this. We already love real estate. Why not just try to buy larger, larger properties? Mm -hmm. Slow go at first. Took about a year to get our first first deal. We were looking at other things too, like self storage and custom home development and franchises. Basically anything. My whole thing was I had a big why. My why was, hey, I want to stay married. Um, I want to provide financially, but also be there for for my family. Um, you know, present. Mm -hmm. So that was a big why. So I was looking at anything that could potentially get out, get out of that. And so many things I looked at were, were going to put me right in the same position. A lot of franchises. I'm like, I'm going to make probably less than I was doing in my IT company. Maybe mm -hmm. you haven't made more. It's the same situation. I'm starting a business from scratch. I have to be in the business all the time. Hard to get to a position where you can sit back and have, you know, cash flow coming in. So that's when we ultimately decided, you know, multifamily is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. took about a year to get our first deal and then since then we've actually done over uh, about eight thousand uh, units now eight thousand today time. okay great yeah. you need to update your your website i know i know <laughs> i know you're a little behind there Maybe we are yeah well that's that's fantastic uh, great story so uh, well just one question uh, what what's your birth order with you you and your twin so we're we're youngest you're the youngest. So, so. Yeah. So when I was younger, I wanted to be older than him. So when I lived <laughs> together in Michigan, I always bragged about how older I was older than him. And now he's in Eastern time zone. I'm central. I brag that I'm younger than him now. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so we're, we're youngest and we saw, uh, really saw pretty much everyone in my dad's family and my mom's family struggle financially. Uh, one of my dad's siblings did did pretty well. Her husband uh, was was uh, an exec and things like that. But that's mm -hmm. not that's like one out of you know he had they had thirteen kids. My dad's family. My mom had you know five. So I mm -hmm. saw so everyone struggling all the time, 
and it was I really had a deep, deep, if one they desire, whatever you want to say, I did not want my kids to have to struggle the way we did financially. I mean, it just didn't, it, did, it would break my heart. I mean, now I understand certain people are in certain positions, but I was young enough where I could make a difference to say, okay, I'm going to do something different. My older brother, nine years older than me, um, we saw him too. He didn't do very well in school. Not that school is really ultimately that important, but reality is, you know, he didn't do well, got pretty crappy jobs, frankly, not making any money. And that was another incentive for me was I need to study. I studied my butt off mm -hmm. in school. Not that I use really anything from school anymore, <laughs> but, um, but reality was I always knew I wanted to do something more. And I, I knew I wanted to kind of do something on my own. I really didn't know what it was. We went through different things, but once we landed on multifamily, we were already doing that since I was 22. Um, it just made a lot of sense. And then when we figured out that once you start going larger in multifamily, larger is relative, we usually buy 100 plus units. But once you go five units and above, the value of the property works completely different. And without mm -hmm. going into all the details of it, just think of it this way. If I have a single family home and it's going to be worth what the house next door and down the street, you know, it can be comps. Mm -hmm. Well, when you do five units or above multifamily, it's considered a business. The lender considers a business. And without going into the details, the math, how it works, it's not made up. It's the way it works at a six cap. If people are familiar with that, every dollar I increase my revenue every, or every dollar I decrease my expenses is $16 of value. I can turn around and someone will give me $16 for every dollar. Yeah. You can't do that in a lot of other investments. And you, you certainly can't do that in four units and below. That's why by and larger makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, that's certainly why a lot of people go into uh, into multifamily once they once they figure out uh, that there, there is a significant difference there between going one small house at a time and and going big. Uh, and yet, from uh, what I understand, and I have not yet bought my large complex, but from what I understand, uh, I'm a real estate broker, so I've done a whole lot of of transactions but from what i understand there's not a whole lot more work in getting a multifamily uh, closing together than there is a, a single family home and i certainly selling a million dollar home or selling a hundred thousand dollar home it's all about the same thing uh, for me as right. a realtor except for the paycheck that's exactly right difference in the exactly paycheck right there. the so, biggest issue people run into typically is Brokers that sell, you know, larger multifamily and sellers that sell large multifamily, they want somebody with a track record already. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, you go get a job. People are like two years. I only want people that are qualified Two years experience. Like, well, how do I ever get a job? If everyone has to have two years experience, it makes no sense. Right. Right. Well, in this case, you just need to find somebody to partner up with that has exactly. experience. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic story uh, there, Mark. Um, I want to take a look here. It's it's always nice to hear uh, everybody's uh, success stories, but really, if that's all we hear about people, I think that uh, it, it kind of makes them look like like plastic, like a Barbie and Ken doll or oh, something yeah. like that. So this question uh, may be a little harder to answer, but uh, what uh, is your life's uh, in your life was your biggest setback, your your biggest disappointment? Yeah, it's not a hard, it's a hard question to answer because of the, of what happened, but I, I have an answer. So in multifamily, uh, we bought over 40 properties, but I had a property in Atlanta with a partner uh, that we had already done a couple of deals with. He was a property manager. He was a general partner in the deal with me. And um, he, well, he took some money. We know he took some money, how much we don't know. And uh, there are a lot of things that kind of happened on the transaction that put it in a position where we were really hurting. I had to dump a bunch of money in. We had to kind of uh, almost kind of fire sell the property. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sleeping, wasn't eating. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we had investors in the deal too, right? So right, yeah. people might be go, oh, well, Mark, whatever. Well, reality is, I mean, I took the steps initially. It was someone I had trusted at the time. Um, people are like, well, how can you trust somebody? They do that. It's like, well, I, it, it can happen. Believe me. And if you're in business long enough, it probably unfortunately will happen. Mm -hmm. But that was really, uh, two, two real big lessons learned there. One was we had 
uh, this particular person who was a general partner, he was also the property manager. I don't like that arrangement um, because when you get rid of him as a property manager, which we did after two months being there, um, it makes it harder from a general partner standpoint because he's still a partner in the deal. So I didn't like that. Mm. Yeah. The bigger mistake, and this isn't uncommon, people do it, is we bought into an existing LLC. Hmm. He already owned the property. Um, we uh, syndicated the deal, kept the same LLC, the same loan, everything like that. Hmm. Well, lo and behold, after we removed him from being the manager, we had liens and stuff being filed on the property from 9, 10, 11 months before I even, I even got involved in the deal. Hmm. Wow. But they're tied to that LLC. So mm -hmm. now they became my liability and my problem and things like that. So mm -hmm. some people do that for tax benefits, like they'll buy an existing LLC so they don't have to uh, pay the additional ta property taxes within the city. Um, I've only done that, like I said, once. Uh, do not recommend it at all. You could do it and have no issues. I, I did it, had major, major issues. So I don't recommend doing that. So those were two huge lessons learned. Um, and an ideal. So you you went into this business actually because you wanted to save your marriage, and then you get into a situation like this. I'm sure that didn't help the marital situation. Um, no. Um, my wife is extremely supportive, so mm -hmm. she feels for me. I mean, I had to dump a fair bit of capital into that deal. Um, and then outside of that, I can't disclose, but it, you know, some other stuff that he did has, has cost me, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, like literally. Right. Um, but uh, my wife always supported me during that. Her biggest thing, because we, this was, um, we'd already been buying for, I'm thinking maybe three years or so, mm -hmm. three, three and a half years. So we were pretty well established. Our marriage was doing much, much better at the time. I was a lot more available to her. Um, you know, I think you oh, read founder of Think Multifamily. I'm co-founder because my wife, Camille, found it with me. And it's, she's not the typical, hey, she's just like supportive. She is directly driving she's many functions of the, of the business of the and yeah, right. growing it and things like that. So we had a, our, our marriage was much, much stronger during that oh, that's time. Good. That's good. I'm sure that helped uh, to weather that particular storm there. Yes. Well, you've... Um, uh, you you, I, you sort of touched on this, but but what did you not necessarily what did you learn from a a uh, a business perspective about this setback, but what did you learn uh, personally about uh, this uh, this experience? What did you learn about yourself? Probably too too trusting sometimes, and I'm a lot less now in a, in a good way, and mm -hmm. and uh, so I think probably should have had probably other other uh arrangements in this and in um frankly just trusted him too much mm -hmm. you know that everything in the he was telling me and showing us on paper and showing us reports everything was factual and people can get away with with deceit if they want to but um that that was my biggest thing probably and then personally as well that and you know investors i care a lot about investors. I'm not just saying that, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases, pretty much every investor with the exception of one has, has come around and really supported us. They really have. Um, that particular person probably never will. And that, that's fine. And I understand uh, his, his position. I do. I could have been probably a little snarky with people because the way they were treating me initially, just a few people, it really was just a handful. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I was the one that had signed the loan. I was the one that had hundreds of thousands of dollars of my own money dumped into the deal that, you know, at risk. Mm -hmm. um, I could have walked away and just said, hey, you know, you know, I, I didn't sign up for this either, you know. <laughs> but um, I learned a, a lot during it that you're, there's no reason to get it. You have to uh, be empathetic of the person's position and why they're, acting a certain way or saying a certain thing a certain way and and uh i understand that and you don't always have to respond in a you know in a even if you're right or factual things like that i've learned that you don't always have to respond back that way you can just yeah. empathize with them and and uh you know you don't have to get credit i'm not trying to get a pat on the back for putting you know a lot of things i did during that deal i never even told people i did 
Um, I wasn't trying to get a pat on the back for it. I was trying to save, save the deal. Right. Well, good lessons learned. Um, you know, it's just part of growing up and, and becoming, I guess, more mature. And, and that's what, you know, setbacks uh, do for us. Make us better people if we can, if we can actually learn from them. Uh, sometimes it's hard to learn from those things, though, and, uh, and ah. move on here. Well, this next question is, uh, you probably, I mean, it seems, I, I don't know, I don't know you that well, but just just from a little bit that we've been here together, this seems like it probably comes very, very natural to you, but it's not something that necessarily comes real natural uh, to a lot of people. And that is, how do you stay positive uh, when, and motivated when it just seems like the whole entire world uh, is against you? And I mean, this may be so intrinsic to you that you've never really thought of the processes that you actually go through to actually maintain that positive spirit when everything is against you. But, but you know, do some introspection here and, and see if you can tell us how you as an individual are able uh, to do that. Because that's a, a, a critical uh, critical success skill, I think. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. I think growing up, um, although my uh, parents were very, very supportive of, of me, they, they, which helped and I always felt love and things like that, I would say um, in some cases in the, in the family, there was a lot of negativity around just things, around people, around the world, around things going on. And believe me, there are a lot of negative things going on. I think as I've gotten older, you know, I realized that um, so I'm, I'm a Christian and, and there are a lot of things that happen in the world that I have can't explain. And I'm not going to try to pretend to explain them when mm -hmm. people are like, well, why, you know, my, my nephew who is 27 days old passed away. Oh, right. My. And, and for me, I don't try to figure it out. I just know if, as long as I'm doing, uh, what I think I should be doing and I have people around me that are supportive and I ask people a lot of questions. The, the biggest thing people can do in a negative way is to be so cocky or conceited that they stop asking other people for input or they ask people for input and they ignore it. Mm -hmm. Both my wife and I are extremely open people. We have a coaching group. We ask people on a regular basis, things we can be doing better. We adjust things like that. So I think for me, um, it's the words spoken. Mm -hmm. so people are like how did my son will be like how do you never get stressed about these things he knows all the lawsuit and you know we were in with that guy and all these different things going on we, we share that with our kids and it's the way I speak more than in my mind it's not to say I don't get nervous or my in my stomach or you know things like that I get you know nervous and, and, and things like that about deals or things going on in my life but I you will rarely ever hear me speak something negative about any of those things mm -hmm. uh, even with the stuff going on in the environment right now i just got the phone with the guy literally you know one minute before we joined this call with you right and i told him right now it's a great opportunity to go buy multifamily because you're going to get a discount it's reality right yeah sure um, it is. some people are running from that so it's it's more um you know the the mind is one and it can play tricks on you and things like that but it, it, it's a spoken word and I'm, and that will, like some of the, something can happen. And I've told her this to you, my wife sometimes, you know, early on would, would say things, uh, I don't think we'll ever be able to do this or get this or do these, do these things. And I, you know, tell her, you know, stop, stop saying those things because um, it actually would, it would bring me down mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'd rather have people think one thing and maybe they're all nervous and scared inside. You don't know it, but just don't speak those things. It's okay to talk to somebody if you're, if you need help, but don't speak mm -hmm. negative things like that. That's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you came from your, your family was, was rather negative. So it certainly, you didn't have it modeled to you, but you seem to have developed. Um, I don't know if it was intrinsic with you or, or it's actually intentionally that you developed the habit of being positive. Um, so, so can you kind of clarify that? Did it just, did it seem to come natural to you or was it, it was it a habit you developed intentionally? The speaking part, my mom, uh, when I was very young, I remember her telling me about, you know, spoken words and images and things like that. And when you're a kid um, and, and things you watch and things you put in your mind and when you're a kid, 
uh, you know, 15, 16 years old, you don't really care. It's the last thing you really care about, right? Okay. You know, right. couldn't watch MTV. We couldn't do things like this, right? And I'm like, or, you know, I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy, right? But um, I always knew word. My mom would always tell me words have power. And they do, right? For good or for bad. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. My mom was more, she had, had a lot of, you know, um, very, very rough upbringing. And she had more of the anxiety and depression and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and um, so the love always was there. So I want to you know, give the impression. I always, always felt loved as a kid, but I would say I, my sisters probably lean more towards being a little bit negative here and there because they, they saw models here and things like that. But I think pretty young, I was very um, aware of spoken words and what they, they could do. And I never wanted to, I always had high, high aspirations. Mm -hmm. I rarely ever want to put things on paper because I thought it might fail and it make me feel like a failure. Frankly, mm -hmm. even today, I don't like to put some things on paper, although that's a critical thing you should be doing for goal right. setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think pretty young, it must have been in me because I was, I was very much the type that wouldn't speak very many negative things. I've got a whole lot of other questions, but we're running out of time here. Uh, and it's been a real uh, enjoyable time uh, time here with you, even though it's been a very short period of time here. Um, I have, uh, have one last question here, and that is, when you come to the end of your life, uh, what would you like to have uh, on your epitaph? Oh boy, it's a great question. So I, uh, I wrote some stuff out before, and then I also, you know, along, I'll get to your, your, your question for sure. I, the, about a month ago, I saw an email come through. I wouldn't even paid, I wouldn't normally have even paid attention to this email, but it said, I, I scrolled down even, I don't even know why I did. I really don't. And it says I'm about writing a, uh, a letter to your kids as if you're going to die in 24 hours. Mm. And for whatever reason, I immediately started doing that. I, I'm not like that. I just, wow. you know, well, wow. and it was, uh, my daughter's 12, my son's 15. And uh, so I first one I did with my daughter and uh, it was very, very emotional. I mean, I literally mm. was crying. <laughs> not just, I mean, oh, I was yeah. Yeah. crying yeah. very, very much. So I gave it to her. I, I told her I had to tell her everything's okay. She thought something's wrong with me. I'm like, no, everything's okay. <laughs> um, the end of the day, it's not about the money. Everyone, not everyone. Most people start out wanting to be an entrepreneur because of money. That's, mm. that's, it is. That's what was my big why. I want to be known for being the best dad. My 15 year old son on, on uh, today is uh, Friday. Wednesday sent me a text at night. We're in the house right together, but he was in another room just said, this is kind of random, but I just want you to know that you're, I couldn't ask for a better father. Oh, wow. So sorry, emotional a little bit right now, but <laughs> end of the day, um, being the best dad and being the best um, husband I can be with that. And then giving back. If, if God gives me money, and gives me skill set to be able to make money, I won't be able to give back. So we give back to, you know, orphanages and charities and sex traffic industry and things like that. So mm -hmm. number one is family and number two is giving back. And then um, my third one, which is probably even lower on the lower than those other two for sure is to be able to um, help other people change their life if they want to through doing, you know, through multifamily syndication and that's why we started doing education was to provide that avenue for people that want to do that. So family first, right? And then, you know, as far as here, um, I want to be known as a godly man and always doing the right thing and things like that too. So um, as you get older, you reflect differently on things that are important to you. And hopefully mm -hmm. people come to the conclusion that it's not all about themselves, not all about the money. Um, they're, they're more there's more to life than that. And you will feel much, much better if you just open yourself up and start giving back to other people. It will hopefully make you feel better. So can you put that in a, a one sentence epitaph? Um, manly God who loves his wife, loves his kids more than anything and helps other people achieve their, their goals in life. Very good, very good. Well, Mark, would you share with our listeners how it is that they can get in touch with you? Yes, it's Mark, M-A-R-K, at thinkmultifamily.com. And love to hear from people and, and try to answer any questions people have. Well, before we close out here, what last words do you have for our listeners? 
You know, people ask, I, I kind of vary that a little bit. I think really the more I look at different things and people trying to do things, you need to under, you need to have a why and understand what your why is. That's going to help. If your why, people like home right, right now, people that are trapped at home, some people are probably pulling their hair out going crazy. Other people are like, my goodness, I wish I could find a way to work from home all the time because mm -hmm. they go to office. I wish I could spend more time with my kids. I spent more time with them now than I ever have before. Figure out what your why is and then um, take action. It's, it's not going to happen overnight, but take action to, to put yourself in a position where you can start changing because if you don't, you're going to be 10 years from now, you know, in the same position. Well, Mark, it has been a pleasure and uh, I would be delighted to have you back on my show at a, at a later date here because uh, I feel like we're just getting started here. I appreciate it, Alan, for sure. I love the, love the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You Thank stay you, safe, Alan. Alan. Thank Take you care. for tuning in to Creekside Bye. Chats Bye. with successful multifamily real estate investors brought to you by Steed Talker Capital. Steed Talker Capital works with both new and established investors nationwide, creating opportunities to flourish in all areas of life. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steed Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steed Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures great and small flourish abundantly. For resources to enhance your well-being through multifamily real estate investment, connect with us online at capital.steedtalker.com.